All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series. My name is Emily Ma, and I'm so excited uh, to open up the winter quarter for this series. It is being presented by the Stanford Technology Ventures Program, the Entrepreneurship Center at the Stanford School of Engineering, and BASIS, the Business Association of Stanford Entrepreneurial Students. Today, I am so excited to introduce to all of you Alyssa Ravazio to the Entrepreneurial Thought Leader Series. Um, Alyssa is the founder and CEO of Hip Camp, which is a comprehensive resource for outdoor stays from national parks to blueberry farms. Hip Camp partners with private landowners to unlock more ways for people to get outside, which we all really need right now. After creating her own digital democracy major at UCLA, Alyssa went to work for the US Department of State's International Information and Communication Policy Department, where she was a member of the Net Freedom Task Force and worked on initiatives in cloud computing, internet policy, and economic impact of internet censorship. She later held leadership positions in operations and marketing for several organizations before founding HipCamp in 2013. In addition to leading HipCamp, she is an active member of the Outdoor Industry Association's Recreation Advisory Council, which supports public policy strategies that encourage the protection, acquisition, and maintenance of public lands while promoting and protecting access to outdoor recreation. Welcome to this community. Before we jump into our conversation, would you mind giving us an overview of HipCamp, Melissa? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me. Really excited and honored to be here. Um, and yeah, I'll give just a brief overview of HipCamp and what we're all about and leave plenty of time for all the questions, the great questions I already see coming in. Um, so this is HipCamp and I like to really start with, uh, you know, a lot of photos of faces because really at the end of the day, what we're creating here is a community. It's a community of people who, who love nature, who want to be outside, who protect the land and take care of the land. Um, and so bringing people together over these shared values is really, um, at the end of the day, what we're all about. Hip camp started uh, very much as a problem I wanted to solve for myself. So um, I was really lucky. I grew up spending lots of time camping. I'm one of three girls. So I think for my parents, it was one of the only vacations that was affordable and manageable. And uh, it was just a huge part of, you know, how I grew up, um, how I I remember having moments uh, like crossing rivers and having these realizations of, wow, I'm so strong. I can't believe I was able to do that. And it just became this huge part of how I um, grew up and found confidence and, and really um, you know, became, became an adult, uh, which apparently I, I'm told that I am today. So um, for me, you know, the outdoors was always something uh, that I, I did. I just normally went with other people, right? My dad would book, my friends would book, um, especially for overnight camping trips. And when I started trying uh, to plan my own trips, I moved to San Francisco after being in uh, DC, after attending UCLA, go Bruins. I just had to get one in there, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I started looking for my own campsites and what I found uh, was that it was incredible incredibly broken and the whole system was really difficult to use and everything was either booked up six months ago or really difficult to find. And in particular, I spent uh, many, many, many hours researching for a trip on New Year's. I wanted to go be by the ocean. That's my favorite place to be. And I just couldn't believe that I had to look at county parks and state parks and national parks and all the private campgrounds. And these were, there were so many different websites that at one point I crashed my Chrome browser because I had too many tabs open. And um, eventually finally found this campsite. This is in Andrew Malera State Park. It's in Big Sur, it's gorgeous. Uh, there were no reservations, which was good news to me because I had not thought to book six months in advance. And upon arriving, uh, I found out that despite doing many hours of research, I had failed to learn what for me was arguably the best part about this campground, which was that it had an incredible surf break. It had a point break, so a very well-formed wave uh, that was coming off of a bluff that was out in, in the sea and I hadn't brought my surfboard. I absolutely love to surf. I'd actually had my board in my car because I was surfing so much, but I'd read all about the campground. And so I figured, you know, if there was surfing, it would have been mentioned. So it seemed safe to take the board out of the car and give my friend in the backseat a bit more room. It was still a great trip, but, you know, really highlighted for me that if you can spend that many hours researching and still end up you know, missing what's probably the most important part of the outdoor experience. This is a really broken system. And so it was actually just the next day, New Year's Day, 
uh, driving back into San Francisco that it kind of hit me that this was a really broken experience and the internet was a really great way to fix it. And so I decided um, to start solving that and uh, learned how to program and uh, built the first version of the site later that year. I am far from the only person who loves to get outside. I'm sure many of you get outside on a regular basis and it's really become a bigger and bigger part of our culture, especially over the last five five or 10 years or so. Um, I think this is a very healthy adaptation to uh, a lot of the other trends in our culture, including technology and kind of this always on uh, pretty high stress, uh, high intensity pace that we're all kind of expected to meet and to match to be successful in the world. So I think it's amazing that people are having this natural reaction to want to find this, this time to relax and, and recharge. The problem is that the industry is really failing to meet these demands. Um, our parks are now regularly booked out six months or more in advance. Uh, campgrounds often look more like, you know, this parking lot uh, than, than what you really see on Instagram and think that you're getting into. Um, and this is a huge challenge. You've got the CEO of Airstream saying one of his biggest concerns about selling more Airstreams is there's nowhere to go. People buy them <laughs> and then they end up with nowhere to go. And, you know, HipCamp really finds uh, a unique way to solve this. And I'm sure we'll get into this in the questions, but this was not my first solution <laughs> to this problem. Um, but this is a solution that we found a couple of years into starting the company that we're really focused on today, which is create more supply. If there's really that big of an imbalance, let's create more places to get outside. And so essentially what HipCamp does today um, is basically open up new parks. We're creating a new kind of park system, one that's powered by the people and has incredibly unique and diverse places to take your van or to pitch your tent. Or if you don't have either of those, no problem. Stay in a tree house, stay in a yurt, stay in a glamping tent. Um, and so we're really about giving people the ability to access the outdoors, regardless of your skill level, regardless of if this is something you, you know, were lucky enough to grow up doing. And in doing so, creating a, a great economic opportunity for now thousands and thousands of landowners across uh, the country here in the US and in Australia as well. I uh, wanted to zoom in on one of these entrepreneurs. This is Montrese. She has a beautiful horse sanctuary um, in Pascadero, so pretty close to Stanford. And, you know, for her finding the ways to, to make the ends meet where she could pay for these horses, she's got a, a place where if you have a horse you might put down um, or that's not doing so well, she'll take it for free. And she'll let them roam around on her 70 beautiful acres of coastal land with more than 180 degrees of ocean view because she's out on Pigeon Point. Um, but financially, that's a hard, you know, a hard gap to close. And so what she found with HipCamp was the ability to, you know, really take this incredible uh, sanctuary she'd already built and just open it up for people as well as the horses. And so she has um, beautiful uh, tent camping and glamping with ocean views with wild horses running around and, and understandably people absolutely love it. And she said HipCamp's been the game changer in her life. She's been able to earn incredible amounts of money on the platform. Um, her husband has been able to leave his full-time job to help her with the ranch. Her daughter's now in on it as well, uh, which is a really common pattern that we hear this becomes a family business as it becomes more successful, which is exciting. Um, and over the past few years, she's been able to grow her revenue by over 700%. So she's really um, like so many of our hosts, just an incredible entrepreneur. She started with basic tent camping. She didn't have a lot of startup capital. So she just kind of said, hey, park your van, pitch your tent. Um, and then she took her earnings and invested in these amazing glamping domes now. And, and she just bought a beautiful Swedish style teepee as well that you can stay in that um, her husband's Swedish and, and helped her find. So, you know, really the, the entrepreneurial spirit and the ability to understand their customers, understand what people want and build um, build out their hip camps accordingly is a huge part of what's working on the platform and really how how the whole marketplace works. We're at a really um, important and powerful moment as an industry, as an outdoor industry, um, and in particular with outdoor stays and camping. Uh, last year was the very first time that more than half of the new people who started camping uh, were from diverse backgrounds. They're, they were not white campers, which is uh, super, super exciting and really is bucking a, a long-term trend that we've unfortunately, unfortunately seen here in the US. And so as a company and as a brand, uh, this is so important to us. This is so core to our mission. And again, we wanna build a world where everybody 
um, can experience the outdoors, regardless of if they, you know, historically have been welcome or allowed in the outdoors, and regardless of if they already have all the cool gear and know how to climb a mountain. And so, you know, really broadening uh, the tent here, so to speak, is is a huge part of our focus. And, you know, I think the the reason this is so important to us is is really at least twofold. On one hand, we absolutely know, and the science now proves that when you get outside, you're happier and you're healthier. And so making that available to everyone feels like a human rights issue, right? It should just be something that everyone knows they can access and has accessible to them. On the other hand, we're facing, uh, you know, pretty steep uh, and scary challenges around climate change and biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse. And, you know, tackling those challenges on a global scale is going to require a lot more and a lot broader demographic than has historically been in the, you know, capital C conservation space. We need to make this an issue um, that a lot more people are aware of and that a lot more people care about. It's absolutely essential, I believe, to the survival of our species on this planet. So, you know, our, our basic theory is that when you get outside, you fall in love with it. And um, by getting you outside and, and you know, we kind of, we've, we've seen this again and again, mother nature really takes it from there. And, we can't take full credit for that. That's really E.O. Wilson's theory of uh, biophilia that we each have an innate love for the outdoors that gets awakened when we're out there. So um, we're really as a as a platform aiming to create those moments of biophilia and make it accessible, accessible to everybody. So the vision we're building up to here is really a world where everyone can experience the outdoors um, across the whole world. And also, you know, for us. We're focused on outdoor stays right now, but over time we want to broaden that to be all the things you want to do outside. We already have many hosts who offer mushroom foraging, horseback riding, all these different outdoor activities. And so over time, you know, really broadening that to be more of a, a full uh, park system is exciting to us. And I'll pause there so we can get into questions. Alyssa, so many of the photos that you had in your slides just really um, made me respond in a very positive and visceral way from Haptome to your mention of mushroom foraging, uh, which is something I love doing in Point Reyes. You know, I'm, I'm actually curious, you know, I want to get into the sort of later stages of, of your, your, your work, but going back to the origin story, you, know, you, you mentioned in the early days, you know, you learned how to code. You, the first year is always a very, very um, uh, sort of interesting point for a startup. And you were, I think, alone your first year working on this before your co-founder, Eric, came along. Um, you know, especially for our students and for our audience, you know, many folks are thinking about potentially, you know, kind of going out there on their own. Like, what was that first year like for you? And, you know, um, what, what, what happened? How did you find ways to persist? What was hard? What was surprisingly easy? Could you share us with us a little bit more about that part of the journey for you? Sure. Um, nothing was surprisingly easy. Let's start there. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think the first year is probably best characterized, at least for me, although I've heard this from a lot of other founders, as these, um, you kind of keep wondering if you're crazy or not, right? Because you're like, I thought I saw this opportunity, but nobody else seems to care. Like, should I just stop? Am I totally crazy? Am I wasting our time? Like, for me in particular, I remember having a lot of anxiety about, like, shouldn't I just like go get a job? Like, am I totally blowing my life here? Like, what am I doing? But I kept coming back to the sense that I knew there was a real problem. And actually probably the best advice that I got that really helped me, um, you know, stay focused here was you really want to be building a business around a problem that is real, right? You don't want to be look, you don't want to be a solution looking for a problem. You want to find a problem, fall in love with that problem and then stay open to the different solutions that might address it. Because for us, at least, the solution changed uh, quite a bit over the first over the first few years, for sure. Um, and then it's really best if you understand and have experienced that problem. And so for me, because I'd felt the just angst of trying to figure out where to go camping, I knew there was something here. I didn't always know that I could solve it, mm -hmm. um, but I knew there was at least something worth trying to solve. And so I think that really, that really kept me going. Um, I was alone, so I solo, I solo founded the company for the first um, couple of years and then had a co-founder join for a couple of years as well and then move on. So it was, you know, it's currently uh, and for the last years have also been solo founding. And I definitely think if you can find a co-founder who shares your vision, that is the way to go. It is definitely uh, a lonely and harder journey, I think, as a solo founder. So I, you know, I think that that is the, um, 
the ideal way to get going, but you can totally do it on your own too. You don't need to find that perfect co-founder. Um, and in some ways I feel like it's, there has been some advantages because I haven't early on when you're changing what you're doing so much, I didn't have to consult and get that alignment. I got to just say, okay, we'll go do this over here. And, and here we go. Um, I'll also say that although I was technically alone, I had great support from my little sisters who have been helping me with stuff kind of my whole life, um, as well as my best friend, Natalie. So they were both like helping out, writing things and finding photos. And that went a long way in just helping me not feel um, totally crazy, right? It was like, well, they think it could, it could work. Um, and then the final thing that I want to acknowledge about starting Hip Camp is I got, I was in a position where I got to work on it full time. I had enough savings that I was able to do that. Um, I'm also extremely privileged in that my family lives, my parents live close to San Francisco. And I knew that if I ran out of money, I could just move in with them and, you know, it wouldn't be that big of a deal and I could still come into the cities. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, it's just important to acknowledge that. I think that was a big part of how I was able to, I literally think I got my bank account down to like a hundred bucks or something before we raised our first check. So um, that, that, you know, being able to ride the, the edge that closely really was dependent on knowing I had parents I could move in with. And I know not everybody has that. So I think that's important to acknowledge. Yeah, Alyssa, uh, the, the students in, in uh, the Spirit of Entrepreneurship did a little bit of a reflection on, on what made you an amazing entrepreneur, just based on what we see uh, in, in the videos and the articles written about you. And uh, we were just so struck by um, just your passion and your grit and your perseverance and mostly just your sense of just your, your, your personal moral compass. And you spoke a little bit about that, right? You know, whether it's the social justice, the equity, the sustainability and the climate change efforts. I, I'm curious, you know, how, how over the years since 2013, as you sort of iterated on hip camp, how did you interweave your personal values and as you develop them with hip camp's values and how did you then um, sort of put those in place with, with your staff members and then even beyond that, your community of hosts and guests? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and very much ongoing work that I think every, every day, every week, every month, every year is something that I'm you know thinking about and revisiting. For me, building a company has always been exciting because of the chance to change culture and have an impact. And I've always been really clear on what I want that impact to be, right? I want to live in a culture where people value clean water and the land and are connected with nature and we stop thinking it's fine to just destroy natural resources. It took millions of years to develop in the course of a few decades. Like that, I want to live in that world and I know we'll get there yeah. <laughs> one way or another. And so I think keeping that vision, um, keeping that vision really clear and I think being, uh, always being in that mindset of like, I know where we're going, I know why we're doing this, mm -hmm. makes it pretty um, clear when things aren't being done in a way that's gonna ladder up to that impact. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, you know, having the focus on the impact and not having the focus be how much money are we making? How fast are we growing? Those things are of course, of course important, right? If you want to attract, especially outside capital, those things need to look good as well. But I guess, you know, before hip camp, I was, uh, an unemployed surfer bum. So the, like the big money is never really what was getting me going. And I, I do think that that can be, I think if you're overly focused on the financial outcome, it's a lot harder to stay really true to the impact um, that you want to have because they might often do diverge. Yeah. Um, and so I think I've just always stayed really clear on why we're doing this. I think, um, you know, within the company, it looks like it's little things, but you know what? They add up. So like we talk a lot about nights outside instead of revenue. How many nights outside are we going to make happen this year? Not how many dollars are we going to make? That'll come. How many people are we going to get outside? How many people are going to sleep under the stars? Um, so that, that's been a, a, a good focus. And then, you know, just actually documenting our values has been really um, That's something that I think a lot of startups wait too long to do. That's probably... I mean, everyone's heard a million times now, but it's actually really helpful just to have that conversation, um, you know, with your team, even as a tiny team, I think it's amazing. So for us, the core value has always been leave it better. And that's really um, rooted in this idea of, you know, you guys have probably all heard of Leave No Trace, which is an amazing organization with lots of great education. And at the same time, we don't think Leave No Trace is 
neither good enough nor realistic. Um, it's not realistic because we have 7 billion and counting people on the planet. So the fact that we wouldn't leave a trace isn't really <laughs> uh, a goal we're shooting for. And then it's not good enough because we've already had a devastating impact on the environment and a lot of our ecosystems are in, in free fall and collapse. And so we need to be restoring, we need to be regenerating, we need to be having a positive impact at this stage. And so for us, Leave It Better is a great way to, you know, work all that together and really align on this core belief that people can have a positive impact on the environment. We don't have to just be the problem. Um, we can actually actually be part of the solution. And I think, you know, if you're going to work in outdoor recreation, you've got to kind of believe that to some extent. <laughs> um, because you are getting people out into land that maybe hasn't had as many people in it. And, and that is something we think about as well. So, you know, values, um, goals, how you talk about goals, how you talk about the mission. Whenever we hire someone, I'm always saying, I'm excited to work with you to get more people outside. Right, mm -hmm. so just going back to that, that mission again and again. And then also programs, like we, um, this year we built a program where we paired, just as a pilot, we started pairing landowners with scientists so they could understand, you know, what species are on their land and how they can better steward their habitat to support, you know, a certain watershed or a certain species. And, you know, that kind of stuff, is it gonna like really accelerate our revenue? Probably not. Um, mm -hmm. Is it good for our brand, which ultimately is gonna be important for the health of our business for sure. Um, mm -hmm. That's not why we're doing it, right? We're doing it because it's it's the right thing to do and how we can make sure we're really gonna have the impact we wanna have. So whether it's big things or little things, I think you just have to always be keeping that in mind and, and keeping the vision of the impact you wanna have really, really clear so you can know when you're, you're drifting off course. Yeah, it's so powerful. Uh, I'm reminiscing on uh, a, a statement that another speaker had made, which is if you make the meaning, the, the money will come, right? But if you start do the reverse, it's much harder to create the meaning. And what Hip Camp has done is really, really sort of laser focused on what is the meaning of the experience that we're creating for your users, whether it's a host or a guest. And um, I, I I think that that's an incredible lesson for us to remember. You know, I, I, you mentioned something earlier that really piqued my interest, which is, you know, you mentioned that getting to this realization that increasing supply was um, your way of solving the problem. It sounds like you went through a series of pivots to get there along the way. Like when you, in your first year, you probably had something that you thought was, this is the solution. But along the way, you figured out, you know, knowing the why, but not necessarily the how or the what. I'm curious how you held the why very dear, but then understood when the right time was to then pivot uh, as you learned with your business. Totally. And I think this is the art of entrepreneurship. I feel lucky that I kind of feel like I stumbled through it. So hopefully by sharing this, you all can, can, can do it a little more efficiently and quickly in the future, uh, possibly. So I think, you know, for me, the, the why was always, I wanted to solve this problem, which could be distilled as, it's just too hard to figure out where to go camping. Like, this is crazy, like, come on. And <clears throat> again, I always knew that laddered up to like, if we made it easier for people to get outside, more people would go outside. If more people go outside, they'll fall in love with nature. We can turn the tide on climate change. Okay, so that that's kind of the, the philosophical side, but. I was always really focused on like, we just have to solve this very practical, tactical problem. And what happened was for the first year of starting the company, I was very naive and was convinced that if I could just put all the campgrounds on one map, mm -hmm. state parks and national parks, the county parks, mm -hmm. that would solve the problem. I thought it was a discovery problem. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't understand there was a supply imbalance. I just thought mm -hmm. that this was too hard to use and I'm just gonna put everything on one map and I'm gonna let people leave reviews and upload photos and that will solve the problem. And that was the first year we were, we were building. And um, by the way, this is maybe a helpful little just side note. I built the website and launched in June, 2013. I was convinced that as long as I hit that deadline, I was gonna like take off for the summer. And I spent the whole, I spent the whole summer with like one or two people using the website every day. <laughs> So just yeah. want to throw that out there. That's like that, you know, just expectations are here. Reality is yeah. Anyway, so that took a while, but then over the course of the winter and the next spring, people did start using the site. Mm -hmm. It did start to take off partially through SEO, partially because my guerrilla marketing efforts where I went to every free meetup I could and just opened my laptop if people said they liked camping and made them giving their email 
uh, started <laughs> to pile up. So people started to find the site, but we got the same feedback um, again and again, which was, look, your site's cool. It's a nice product. It's much easier to use than, you know, at the time it was Reserve America, but everything's booked up. So like, it's mm -hmm. not actually that helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I, my first reaction to that feedback was, well, I'm going to get the government to build more campgrounds. <laughs> I spent a year or two doing that. That is like, so I, came from, I was at the state department before this. So I just, I believe in the government. Happy inauguration day, everybody, by the way. So I just was like, they, they've got to be able to figure this out. You know, like up here, I'm, I'm in Marin, we have Mount Tam State Park. It's massive. Yeah. It is less than an hour from a massive urban area. And it has like 40 campsites in the whole park. And I was like, guys, just like build a couple more campgrounds. What's going on? People need to get outside. This is public health. Yeah. And the, you know, California State Parks in particular, God bless them, amazing people. Um, they're very patient with me. They let me come up to Sacramento all the time. And they would always take my meetings and they would always hear me out. But it actually took a year or two for me to finally learn that the way their budgeting works is just super messed up and, and really should change. They don't keep the revenue from camping. It goes back to the state's general fund. They've got to beg for a new budget every year. Parks are often used as a political chip to signal, hey, austerity times, we need to cut back on spending. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're just constantly underfunded, chronically. Yeah. And so the last thing they want to do is increase their liability by mm -hmm. creating more facilities. And it took me like a year or two before someone finally sat me down and was like, let me explain to you the economics of public parks and why that's not going to happen. And I was pretty devastated um, when I finally understood that we'd also been working in parallel to create new precedents around open data, which we were successful in doing at the federal and the state level. And I was just so invested in this that it was, um, you know, it was a big setback and it was really hard. And it was only in that moment of like, I have no idea what we're going to do as a business model. I literally went to a restaurant with my boyfriend, now husband, and wrote down on a tablecloth, business models for hip camp. Mind you, we've raised $2 million and I have like 10 people working for me. And I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. This public land thing isn't going to work out. Yeah. And we actually wrote out all these different models. One was like gear and food delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, one was an ad supported Yelp business. And then there was this private land idea, which really came came from a landowner emailing me and saying property taxes are tough maybe maybe people would want to camp here and I could then pay my property taxes and I wouldn't have to sell this oh. land because I don't want to huh. and what helped me make that decision which ultimately was you know the most important decision in the company's life <laughs> um, was we went through an exercise where I said 10 years from now if this model is super successful mm. what have we accomplished and yeah. it became really clear to me that gear and food delivery, while great businesses that help people, at the end of the day, you're helping people trade money for time, right? You're helping rich people save a little bit of time. Yeah. And then the ad business, I, I already kind of knew there wasn't enough places to camp. So while I knew I could build an app that would make some money off ads, it didn't feel like I was going to make camping that much easier to find. Mm -hmm. And so private land, it wasn't until I looked at it through that 10 year lens that I was like, whoa, if this works, we'll completely transform how people get outside will radically increase the amount of available places for people to go and will create arguably the most scalable model for protecting land and habitat on the planet. Mm -hmm. Like, let's do that one. So I think it was really by keeping that vision clear of where I knew we wanted to go that I was able to choose a business model out of a hat, basically. I didn't have research. I didn't do like pilot studies. It was, there wasn't like a big, you know, a smart, there probably should have been, but I didn't have like a smart MBA student helping that out. <laughs> You know different strategies for me i just you know i went with my gut and i think um i don't i don't think i would have been able to make that choice if i hadn't been so clear on where i wanted all of this to go you know i, I think sorry really quick i think the big theme there now that i think about it is like when you pivot when you when you're refining which everybody does yeah you have to listen to your customers it's, it's just like it was each step there if you think about it whether it was state parks finally telling me here's the thing about our economic situation, or it was a landowner telling me, hey, property taxes are tough, or it was early users saying, your site's cool, but everything's booked. Like I, I had to listen to know where to go. You know, that, that was very clear to us that you were able to very humbly receive feedback 
and really have an informed intuition. So while you might not have hired a smart MBA to do the analysis for you, I think the years of intuition that you had built up to that moment of a pivot was actually incredibly well informed, and you know, and and, and you, it gave you the courage to make that decision to to make that pivot. And, you know, speaking of pivots, what a year! What a year! You know, you've had, a, we've all had, COVID, everything else that's happened in 2020, and I know that Hip Camp um, went through a whole lot in 2020. And you know, I, I I'm curious if. You know, if you look back um, in in the last twelve months, you, you you've expanded internationally and acquired a company. You've gone through a couple of pivots uh, with respect to COVID. You know, there was a drought and there was a flood. You know, if, if maybe you could just talk about what the experience has been for you in uh, for the company, for you, for your, for your for your community. Like, what has it been like? Uh, and and what lessons were learned? And what do you hope for moving forward? Yeah, it's definitely last year was crazy think for everybody. Um, you know, I think that it's really this year has taught me a lot in terms of hardship and challenge. And I think it's super natural to really when things are hard to feel upset about that. And I'm starting to get to a place where when things are really hard, this is on my good face. Um, I'm like, you know what? we're going to figure this out and we're going to come out better and stronger, right? Like every hardship really is a chance to build a much stronger yeah. company. Yeah. And so for us early on with COVID, I mean, it was apocalyptic. We lost almost all of our bookings for months on end. We mm -hmm. actually did layoffs. Like it was, it was just super scary and the saddest, you know, the saddest decision I've ever made in a company's life. Um, I think one of my big learnings, learnings there was, you know, really for the first time understanding what it means to be CEO. For many years, I've had a lot of kind of interpersonal issues where I just, I get so annoyed when people treat me differently. I'm like, I'm just a teammate. Why does everybody act so weird? I <laughs> never, like I have a job, you have a job, it's all a job. Like, why do you act so funny? And I think it was only through going the process of a layoff that I was like, oh, oh shit. Like my job, like I literally can make someone who's employed today, unemployed tomorrow. Like that is an incredible amount of responsibility. And it's just not fair for me to expect people to you know, forget about that and treat me like one of their friends. And so I think it really, um, it, it really helped me understand a lot that I think I'd been missing over the past few years, just about what, what this job is and, and, and why it's so hard. And I would say I was so, um, I was so impressed by our team and the mm -hmm. resiliency and how people came together and um, as you mentioned, shortly after the layoffs, a few months later, we had uh, just an incredible amount of growth. And at that point, our team was quite a bit smaller <laughs> than it had been, but we had quite a, quite a bit more to do. And so, of course, we brought back um, quite a few of the people who'd been impacted. Give me one second. I'm so sorry. I, I we have lost sound. Am I back now? I'm so oh, you're sorry. Back. You're back. This is perfect. Sometimes a router hijacks me. Where did I drop off? Uh, probably around. Give it 45 seconds or so. So um, I think you dropped off when you were speaking about bringing people back uh, after um, the, the COVID sort of reversal. Yep. So yeah, so we brought some people back, but we also learned how to be more efficient, right? We also mm -hmm. learned how to solve problems. Kind of that hardship like forced us to, we didn't really have another option. And so we learned that we should just fix the problem in the product instead of hire one or two people to deal with the fallout for, as an example. Um, so that was a big learning. And then moving into Australia, expanding into um, that continent was super fun. Our GM in Australia warned me, but I think it's worth repeating that you know, the United States, especially as of late, doesn't have the best reputation abroad. And so I, um, I mm -hmm. definitely learned a lot in terms of just how important it is when you expand into another country as an American company. Um, 
to just be really thoughtful and really sensitive and just really make sure that like we made a mistake where our search uh, we didn't, we forgot basically to resort our search so that in Australia, you would see, you know, Sydney before San Francisco, no matter what you were typing in as an example, which seems obvious. And people weren't like, oh, it's a cute startup that it still has bugs they're working through. They were like, yep, super self-centered Americans. We knew it. Right. So I think just <laughs> like now something i say a lot is like we're going to build a global company this is not going to be an american company that operates in lots of countries this is going to be a global company and we're not going to be america first we're going to be global first and that's really aligned with you know what i what i want the company to be anyway and kind of the vision um there um and yeah i would say some those are some of the main lessons i also think you know with the layoffs in particular it was such a hard it was such a hard decision. I was so impressed by our, our team's resiliency. And I also really learned, this is gonna sound silly, but um, how to put this? I had to come to terms with the fact that there's no way to build a company and have everybody like you. Yeah. I had really not been honest with myself about how much I was still holding on to that. Like, of course I talked about that like with my coach and I was like, okay, it's not about making everyone like me. It's not about making everybody happy. But it wasn't until, you know, knowing I'd made the right decision and yet still having so many people just really personally say, you're wrong, what you did was wrong, to, to really, I had to face this fact that like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have everyone like me. And that, um, that was super hard, but I think, you know, I just care so much about people and relationships. That's like how I get my energy and, and what I really I'm driving off of that. It was also really important just to take a little bit of that pressure off. I'd been, I thought if I just worked hard enough and I was smart enough and emotionally intelligent enough that I, I could do this and have a hundred percent of the world love me and just, no, that's not a thing. So I think, um, especially as a female, I, we've been really trained to, to think that that's, that's a huge sign that we've done something terribly wrong. And it was super interesting to be like, actually, I don't think I did anything terribly wrong. And these people really don't like me and like, wow, like, let me just sit in that discomfort and that paradox and like figure out how to move forward. Like, that's weird. Um, that was probably one of my, my bigger, my bigger learnings as well. Incredibly powerful. Uh, you are such a self-aware person. You, you've, you know, I, I, as you're speaking, <laughs> I reflected on uh, the in, inaugural poet laureate's poem this morning, you know, the hill we climb. And she said two things. She said, um, as we grieve, we grow. As we hurt, we still hope. And and that that for me really resonated with the storytelling that you just shared with us about your COVID experience. You know, I, I realized that you know, somehow an hour is disappearing on us and I wanted to give our students a chance to ask some questions. So we have a lot of questions and I think maybe we start with the, the ones that have the most votes and I'll, I'll just start by reading them out and, and we'll see how many we can get through in the next 10 minutes or so. Cool. Okay. So the first to do kind of rapid, rapid fire so we can get through a lot or yeah, let's try it. okay. I'm going to read fast then. Okay. So platform business models seem very hard to scale up. What was your strategy uh, to grow hip camp and maintain that balance between suppliers and clients, both in terms of population size and mutual interest? Oh my gosh, that is, that is the marketplace question. That's great. Um, you got to figure out how to hack it. So for us, we hacked it um by it's a chicken and egg problem uh we built up supply with public land first right mm -hmm. so we had supply that brought us demand and then we were able to start layering in private land to existing uh demand that was already there so i think figuring out how to get one side of the marketplace kind of going so that you can get the other side going is critical and then over time as we scale up you know i think it's always important to understand what expectations are you setting with either side of the platform? And so for a lot of our hosts, they're okay if they join and it takes a few months to get their first booking, especially if it's the winter or they're in a new market. And so I think just setting good expectations and we're now in a place where we know if we build up host population, you know, we can layer in demand very quickly after and, and that works too. So I think it changes as you grow, but definitely figuring out how to crack the chicken and egg problems different for every marketplace. and. So good. All right. This one has 13 votes. Very popular. Is it accurate to think of your company as the Airbnb of the outdoors? Do you think they'll try to move into your market? Ooh, good one. Okay. Um, ah, 
I prefer Airbnb of outdoors to Airbnb of camping because people sometimes try to say that and it's like, no, we're doing glamping, we're doing RVs, we're increasingly adding on these things called extras where you can book, you know, farm tours or mushroom foraging classes with your hip camp. So if you're using Airbnb as a shorthand for like overall sharing economy, I guess so. I will say that I think what we're doing is still fundamentally different and that we also have all the public land, right? Our, our overall theory is that seeing the public parks alongside these private land, like we actually have real-time availability, hard-earned real-time availability through open data um, with the federal government. So you can actually see is Yosemite booked up or not on HipCamp as well. And so I think, I think that having kind of both public and private sides makes us uh, pretty unique there. And then in terms of if they'll move into our space, you know, I think um, I think this year has definitely made them more interested in the outdoors and kind of rural markets than they have been. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's just really different use cases. I think people think of Airbnb when they want a cool place to stay that's not a hotel. People think of Hip Camp when they want to go outside and be under the stars and be in nature. And so I think there's enough of a, of a difference there that, you know, even if they move more into the space that, um, it'll still be kind of different, different things in people's minds. Excellent. Okay, this one is a good one. I think I'm very interested in this one too. So HipCamp has been doing really well as a relatively private company or a private company. Uh, any advice for fundraising for women and female founders? Yeah, um, this is what worked for me. I don't know if this will work for everybody. I just convinced myself that being a female founder is a huge advantage for fundraising. Mm -hmm. I don't want to look at the numbers. I always have people who are like, wow, only 3% of venture capital at this level goes to women. I'm like, I don't want to know. <laughs> I don't want to know about it. So for me, it's always been, I'm different. Mm -hmm. They're going to remember one way or the other. Um, and I think that just kind of gives me a little more uh, confidence going into things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's worked for me. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other general lessons. I guess the other thing would be like, probably don't over index. I'm trying to have everyone like you. That seems to be a pretty common pitfall. Excellent. Okay, next one. HipCamp has been doing really well. Oh, wait, uh, that seems like the same question. I'm gonna move on. Um, what have you learned from messy situations? Uh, missed books, difficult experiences with owners and users, anything really uh, that might happen as HipCamp started to grow? Hmm. Yeah, people are definitely not at their best when they've been let down or disappointed. Um, so, you know, we've just built up our support team is incredible. We have a support team that is so high empathy. They're able to get on the phone with someone who's just having like the worst day of their month and just is ready to yell about everything and just stay calm and kind of hold that space and not take it personally. And I think that's such a gift. I don't know if I could do it. I sometimes work on the support desk and I'm like, this is so hard, how do you guys do this all the time? Um, and so, yeah, I think the big learnings are like, you know, look, there's policy, you can always improve product. You can always improve policy. Like you have to look at what's causing bad experiences. Like we group the data, we're, you know, systematically knocking them out and always improving. At the same time, like stuff's gonna happen, especially if you're doing online to offline real world experiences. And I think having a, you know, super respected, super talented support team that can kind of handle those human moments <clears throat> with great with grace is critical. There's no substitute for that. Amazing. All right, let's keep going. Knock and map. Okay. I've noticed over the past year that prices have gone up. How do you evaluate who's pricing? What analytics are you running and sharing with hosts? Hmm. Our average price per night's actually gone down a little this year. Um, but this must be like in a specific market maybe, or I'm not sure where this person's seeing this data. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that one, but our average price has actually gone down a little this year. In specific markets, we definitely know, like if you're in the Bay Area, for example, which maybe many of you are, this market's so supply constrained that we definitely see, like when occupancy is consistently high, we definitely see prices go up. Um, so that might be what you're referring to. And, you know, what we do is we definitely, we provide guidance, right? We have a product built out that shows hosts, like what are people charging in the area? What mm -hmm. should you charge if you want to have, um, 
you know, maximum occupancy. We're going to be building out more of that. But, you know, we, we view ourselves as a platform supporting entrepreneurs. So we'll give them information, but we're not trying to, you know, tell them what to do in terms of pricing. And when we do see prices getting high, again, it's normally because occupancy is too high. And then our job is to add more supply <laughs> uh, and give you new places to go that, you know, generally won't cost as much. Um, although I will say we've learned the more supply in any area, the more money every host makes. So it actually isn't like, you know, we're bringing down the prices for those more expensive hosts. We're just adding more places to go. Fascinating. Okay, this question is very long. So uh, forgive me, I'm gonna read it reasonably quickly, but I think you can see it. Your business takes only 7% of the revenue made in the transaction. A common criticism I've heard from e-marketplaces is along the lines of entrepreneurs arguing that the cut needs to be higher to break even or that the service needs to take a lower cut in order for landowners to be profitable, especially for smaller entities. And others might argue that an annual monthly membership fee is necessary to provide a stream of revenue for hosting different business businesses. How did you decide on 7% weighing these criticisms and concerns, especially when pitching to customers and investors? Um, okay, great is a great question. Um, we definitely take more than 7%. So I'll, I guess I'll start there. Um, before our cost of sales, which include you know insurance and payment processing for the credit cards and um, our support team and a bunch of things like that, we're actually taking a little over 20%. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, that's a healthy take rate. I don't think we'd be able to, we, could we scale the business on 7%? Maybe, I don't think so. Um, camping's not that, you know, people don't spend that much money on camping, right? So the volume of transactions would have to be super high. Um, we got to that number <clears throat> and look, it shifts, it changes. Um, we've changed our pricing model a few times. We used to charge the host 20% and then not have any camp fees and our host got really upset and felt like that was really unfair and that the fee should be shared. So we shifted there. Again, I think it's a process of listening, right? Like making sure you're, you're measuring the impact of your, of your pricing model. Um, I pay a lot of attention to like, you know, what are those costs of sale and are we building a business where that is going down and over time we're increasing our gross margins and having a more efficient uh, and profitable business. That's super important, obviously over time. Um, so yeah, you know, I also like, <clears throat> I do a host interview at least once a week, um, hmm. often really successful hosts. Hmm. And I often ask them, should, do you want us to charge you less? Because some of these people are doing six figures and above. And I'm like, so should we charge you less? And they're always like, no, but could you like build this thing into the iPhone app or like get a person in this market? So there's, a, you know, I think that, that to me is like kind of what I, uh, and obviously that's a little like anecdotal and not, you know, perfect survey data, but I ask the question directly to our most successful hosts. And until I hear, you know, hey, yeah, you're charging too much. I think, um, I think we're at a good spot. That's beautiful. That's very much, you know, they, your brand and your relationship is really on value creation. So, you know, yeah. the, the value has always been much greater than the costs. Um, so let me finish up with one question since I know we have one minute left. Um, one of my colleagues here, her name is Tina Selig. She wrote a book called What I Wish I Knew When I Was 20. And I'm curious if you could add you know, a page to this book or, you know, a snippet to this book, like, what do you wish you had known when you were 20? If you could go back to the 20 year old version of yourself and provide your 20 version, the 20 year old version of yourself with one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh man, I wish I'd seen this one coming. Um, I have three, is that okay? What's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So it's top of mind because we were just talking about it, but I really, I just, I turned 30 last year. So it's very mm -hmm. top of mind for me. I think I spent way too much energy. Like I wish I could go take energy back. I spent between 20 and 30 trying to get everybody to like me. Like that mm -hmm. would be really great. <laughs> and that's not to say that like relationships aren't the most important thing to me. It's just like, yeah, like that's not, it's not always your fault, right? It's not always like, you're not going to get hundred percent there. Um, so that would be a huge one. And then I also think like, especially if you're, you know, looking into entrepreneurship or starting a company, like, don't think for one second, you can stop taking care of your body and yeah. that's going to help you. Like I did that for the first years of the company. Guess what? I got shingles guys, shingles. 
that's something that like 80 year old people get when their immune system is like you know like I got shingles at like 26 or 7 so don't do that like it's just not worth it and like you think that you're you know getting ahead but then you have to slow down later and it's not worth it so I think I wish that I wish someone had explained that to me a little bit better I wish that I'd known that that's just not it I think our culture really glorifies burning out um and then you know I think that I think that you know the I just I just I think that fear is always a good often a good indicator of what you really want to do oh um and so I've always had a good practice of like what am I afraid of let me really understand it and let me like run into the fire um but I wish I had done more of that faster actually because I think that you know I'm of the opinion that like any decision that you make from fear in general is a bad one, unless you're actually like life is in danger. Um, so yeah, I wish, you know, there's more, more understanding on my part around just how, how valuable understanding what you're afraid of can be in terms of what you really want to do and go and, and be in the world. This is so beautiful and such a wonderful conversation. I'm afraid we have to finish up here and, and we're actually a little over time. I wanna just from the bottom of my heart, thank you, Alyssa, for, for spending this time with us for our entire audience. And you know, for those of you who are gonna come back next Wednesday, we're gonna be hosting co-founder and CEO of Rad.Live, Tony Mugavero. Uh, if you're interested in seeing some of our content, we have something like 20 years worth of content on etl.stanford.edu, speakers like Alyssa coming every Wednesday. So we'll see you then and thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Thanks for having me.